<clears throat> okay, so we started wrestling last week on judging, and we're going to talk a little more about this week. I've got quite a bit of time. I might get this done this week. Maybe. So, um, we're on question number 12. We're going to start to talk about the scribes and the Pharisees a little bit. So, we read uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, and we've been picking them apart a little bit. <clears throat> um, what are the scribes and Pharisees considered being in the Bible? Who are they? What were they, basically? <coughs> People who didn't believe in the restoration of the dead. Those religious leaders of the day, right? And, and like Brother Roy said, I thought the scribes used to be coffee, but they wrote the Bible and stuff. Like, made the coffee. Exactly right. You've been looking at my notes, haven't you? <laughs> so, um, the third thing, what were the dues of the scribe? Those are our copies of Scripture and very important documents. <laughs> Now, here's some interesting stuff, and I'll speak to y'all write this down. I thought y'all might think it's kind of neat. Um, they had processes for writing copies. You know, you gotta remember, they didn't have the whole Bible, and they had the, the four or the five, the first five books of the Bible, Pentateuch, it's called. Um, they had a lot of procedures and, and rules they had to follow. They could only use clean animal skins, both the right on or even buy manuscripts. Each column of writing can be no less than 48, no more than 60 lines. They had to be black in a special recipe. Each word had to be read aloud when they wrote it. I mean, just there's so many things, particular details. That's probably why they got to the point of being so judgmental because they mind was programmed to be so disciplined themselves that yet they kind of push that off on everybody else. Now, let's go to Matthew 23, 23. Did Jesus tell the scribes and Pharisees they should not judge? And if you remember last week we read Matthew 7, 1, it says judge not lest you be judged. You take that one verse by itself, that's what it sounds like, right? Maybe we're trying to teach a little more, uh, a little more interpretation of that. Okay, in context. <clears throat> I'll read this. We've got several verses here. Matthew 23, 23, read to verse 33. <clears throat> this is Jesus talking. Well, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have admitted to make weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These <clears throat> ought you have to do, you to have done, and not to leave the other undone. You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup of the platter. But within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first <clears throat> that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are likened to the whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, you are also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Wow, what a statement. Well, and you scribes the Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would have not been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? So Jesus is really kind of scolding pretty good here, isn't he? He's not sugarcutting it a bit. He's letting them have it. Now you notice the question I hear, did the, Jesus tell the scribes and Pharisees that they should not judge? Let's look, go back and look at verse 23 again. It says, <clears throat> For you have paid tithe of men of ass and cumin, okay? Jesus told me they've done that. But have omitted or neglected the weightier matters of the of the law. What's that word right there mentioned? So is he saying they shouldn't have done it? No, he's saying you should. Right. They paid their tithes and stuff, but they wasn't doing these others and not doing them correctly. Okay? 
Well, what they did keep hammering them on through this whole thing, hypocrites, hypocrites. They was judging with hypocrisy. That's the wrong kind of judgment. That's one kind of wrong judgment. They judge with hypocrisy. Which means what? Favoritism? No, no. Unspiritual what? Hypocrisy, well, like you said, they tried to make themselves look so righteous, but you can't, you can get an example. My mom and dad are hypocrites. I'm kind of smoking and cussing. But they, they told me, Junior, I'm a junior, and my dad's noble too. Junior, if I ever see you smoking, I'm going to make you eat them. And I got smoke rolling out for years. That's a hypocrite. Okay? And then, if you say cuss, I'm going to wash your mouth out with soap. I know cuss, cuss. That's hypocrite. You can't. You can't. Tell people should. what to do and not do what you're saying. Exactly. Spiritually. Right. Okay. It's like, you know, my kids, and I'm, I'm, well, not, yeah. I'm not perfect, okay? I don't want to mean they'll come across that way. But when I raise my kids, I try to live by example. They were not going to use me as an excuse to do drugs, to speed 100 miles an hour down the road, to cuss, drink. They weren't going to blame it on old dad. Well, dad done so I tried to live where I wasn't a hypocrite. And that's kind of hard to do. I mean, I remember, and there's sometimes God, kids are pitching your place sometimes. They don't care to speak up and humble you real quick. Uh, I think I mentioned this one before. I mean, not everybody was here. My son Aaron got saved when he was seven. <clears throat> and some people like, well, it's too young. He knew what he was doing. I had no doubt about that. That kid was very sure for his age. He knew exactly what he was doing. But anyway, I've done daily devotions with him, and they said, right after they got saved, till they was up in the high school, literally, every day, in devotion. They went on vacation, I took the devotion book, we'd done it in the hotel every day. I kept it up. I made sure they knew it was important. And we read a devotion book one day, talking about uh, basically calling people names. And the Bible has a scripture, I believe it's in the... Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And we're in chapter 7. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount we're talking about right now. Yeah, all really. Right, exactly. And there's a section that talks about uh, saying the right there or thou fool. Okay? Well, translated, some of that means moron. Okay? Empty headed, air headed, moron. Okay? Those kind of things. So I was down in Huntington there in the park area there, and somebody cut me off on one of the butchers here. And he cut me off, and that ran me off the road. And my son, he was in the back seat. I said, you doggone moron. He said, Dad, I didn't think we were supposed to say that. So I had to, you know, this is the thing. When you mess up, you need to admit you messed up. Don't say, don't try to justify it because you're teaching them a bad lesson when you do that. I had to be man enough and say, yeah, right, so you're right. You're exactly right. I have to repent for that. That was wrong. So, you know, I can't tell him, don't call people names when I just did it myself. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of the example of these guys. That they just, it's hard for they just They judge so harshly, but yet they was letting stuff slide on their name. They were being hypocrites. <clears throat> uh, verse 24 also kind of, kind of puts it on a contrast there if you've never understood this. It says, verse 24 says, You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Okay? And what that verse means, you know, in the Old Testament, the Levitical laws, you had clean and unclean meats. Okay? Well, that is considered unclean. They would strain their water to make sure they didn't swallow that by accident. That's how strict they was, okay? But yet, Jesus said, you'll strain a gnat, but yet you'll swallow a camel. That's quite a contrast, isn't it? <laughs> I'm just picturing this strength in the water. <laughs> yeah, they strain their water to just to make sure they didn't strain and, you know, swallow a gnat. Like that's what 
way we're talking about. Like it was this big, huge process of how to wash your hands. And I'm like, You want to say something to uh, No, I don't. I don't. Hmm. There's nothing else on. Someone's tapping into the line. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take my glasses off. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> wonder why I would just start now. I don't know. Yeah. Strange. So... <clears throat> It just, you know, you go from one of those smallest unclean animals to a camel. That's quite a contrast. And Jesus is just trying to drive a point home here. And, of course, you know, if you notice, he said, well, you described the phrase hypocrite seven times. And seven is a representative of completion or whole. So that's kind of me too. So anyway, you get it. So did Jesus tell the scribe the phrase they should not judge? No, he didn't tell them they shouldn't. He actually said they should. There in that verse 23 we just read. But they was judging with hypocrisy. Okay? Just to kind of put it on context. Now we go to 15, and we'll kind of sum it up here. What was a couple of things Jesus said that the scribes and Pharisees were guilty of? And we just talked about one of them. What do you call them seven times? Hypocrite. They ain't hypocrite. And also judging so harshly. They had no mercy, no compassion. Like I said, when I first got saved, that's the way I was. I was just like, Hardcore turn or burn, you know, you get perfect you're out of here, you know. One strike you're gone, I mean. <laughs> and that's wrong, you shouldn't be that way. Now with that said, that doesn't mean you should be um, accepting everything. I mean you can't be like, oh it's okay, bless your heart. I mean, yeah, you have to take a stand, okay? I ain't saying let everything slide, but you don't have to be so harsh. Okay, um like I said this this judging I had to learn myself. Um, there was a time that I was called for jury duty. This was back when I was a young Christian. Didn't know my Bible real well. I studied it, but I didn't know it real well. And I thought judging was completely wrong of any kind. So when they called me for jury duty, <clears throat> I asked to be excused. So I told the judge, I said, sir, I said, your honor, I said, I cannot watch a TV show like a cop show or something like I find myself judging the characters and I don't know if I can do that. I feel like I'm doing wrong. And I'll never forget what the man said. He said, you know what? He said, I'll excuse you, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, respect your religious beliefs, but he said, you're the exact the kind of people we need on the jury. And that always stuck with me. And when I learned later on, he was right. I thought, mm, I messed up. <laughs> but I didn't know, that, you know. Yeah. I may do things wrong, but God knows I try to do what's right every time. I do my best. And, um, you know, like I said last week, we make judgments every day. Uh, somebody pulls up to give you a ride, and they got a car, and you got a door that's held on the zip tie, and you got a baby stir on the bike, and one tire's flat, and uh, duct tape, bumper duct tape on there. Are you gonna get in the car? Got flat. Well, no. <laughs> Why? Because you judge the car's unsafe, right? <laughs> so we make judgments every day. Um, and that's true. You made a good point. We make judgments every day. Right. There's a difference between making judgments and being judgmental. True. Okay. And that's what I'm trying to drive home here. We, the, the scribes and Pharisees, they was judgmental. Um, you've heard my wife talk about her, um, her cousin or aunt. I get her relation. She's got a big, I, I got a small family and I can't keep up with mine. You get past my aunt and uncle, I'm lost, okay? So I can't keep up with her. She's got a huge family. And most of them died off now, but she's got a huge family. But anyway, that relative of hers, the one I blocked, she is super judgmental. I mean, those that knew my mother in law, Dorcas Burdett, that woman was like, in my book, she's like a saint. I'm telling you, she was a very, her, she was a biblical Doris. She was sweet as to be, humble, did anything for you. She took people to the doctors. I mean, you didn't go to the house or feed you a piece of pie or something. I mean, she was 100% hospitable. She was a creature's perfect wife to me. I mean, she was just a good woman. 
with that lady was so judgmental, she goes condemn her, she's gonna go to hell. And that's that's why I just blocked her. She's driving step crazy. Like, don't don't fight with that. Just don't hurt your Bible with somebody. They want they got a question, they're sincere, you know, ask answer them. Somebody wants to just argue fight Bible, I'm not gonna play. You know, that's just why I am. I don't think God's pleased with that. Yeah, you know, it's like hypocrisy. I look up you know, in my old references. I've got a bunch of old references. In my old references, it says a hypocrisy is something you're not. What's something we have to be careful about? Sometimes we, we, we say we're something, but we're not. So we have to be real careful. As we go through our life each day, we have to be an example. Don't be a hypocrisy. And, and, I, and, not, and don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that towards you or anyone for that matter. But, but just, that's just what my old reference is that word means. And it, it's something to think about. Because it's so easy to want to be something you're not. Just be what God made you and be happy with yourself. I don't know why this is acting up so much today for. That, the mic, your mic's the only one on. I don't know what's going on. It's working perfect. Operating technique. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let's get to question 16. Somebody go to James 4, 10 through 12, read them verses for me. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judges the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? Okay. Now, that verse sounds kind of complicated, don't it? Has anybody got any idea what it's trying to drive, what it's trying to drive home here? So what are we guilty if we try to be everybody's judge? And they say, I, I'm trying to teach you judging is not wrong, it is the right way, but yet there's a lot of warnings in the Bible about judging, so you better be careful. <laughs> but what's it saying here? If you want to judge everybody's judge, what is what warning are you what's it getting here? What are you trying to be? Whose job are you trying to take? I, I have the right, biblically, to spiritually discern right from evil. Right. Uh, the judgment you judge is judgment you meet. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not the condemner, but I have to be able to discern right. good and evil. God gave me that gift. As the Holy Spirit, I'm not saying special gift. He gives that to us to know. To know to do good. Right. That doesn't mean, but I'll tell you, I, I know what, you know when your boy's wrong. Mm -hmm. Did you judge him? I know how you made a joke. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I judge well, him. he gives us that right, right not to say you're cast out, or, but he gives me the discernible judgment. To know the difference. You know, but you know, I'm not the guy that can cast you into the lake of fire right. or send you into the kingdom. Right. But I'll tell you, I thank God that He gave me the spiritual discernment right. to know. And we're going to get to that maybe. The okay. discernment, let's think about let's think about words now. Okay. Butch is big on words and I am too. If you take the word judge, what are some synonyms, other words that mean the same thing? Discernment is one of them. Examine is another one. Okay? There are a lot of different words out there that mean the same thing. It means a judge and make a decision weighed on evidence, facts. Okay? That's proper. So when you judge things without facts or knowing anything about it, that's when you cross the line and you went the wrong way. Okay? Uh, so anyway, back to the question here. Um, one thing I try not to do, and I might be good at it sometimes, but I try not to, I don't want everyone to leave a question and you all not know what the answer is. 
you know, sometimes with me and Dave, we get talking about it. Sometimes we forget to like, did they get the answer or not? <laughs> so anyway, what we guilty of right here says there is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who is that? That's, that's God, right? Jesus, God. Uh, we're, we're taking his job. We only got one lawgiver, right? We're trying to be everybody's judge. We're taking his job. He's the judge, right? So be careful. Now, 17, I got another little interesting. You'll like this story here. I hate talking about myself sometimes, but I think it helps you remember stuff. <laughs> How does God's judgment differ from ours? Somebody go to 1 Samuel 16, 7. Read that for me. 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord <coughs> So how do we typically tend to judge a lot of times? Parents. Uh, parents. That gets you in trouble. You know, why did they pick uh, the first king in the Bible? What was one reason they picked him as king? Anybody know? Yeah, he was tall, strong, way tall. Yeah. Right. He had a parent, he was a, yeah. his head and shoulder yeah. tall. He was yeah. He looked good. He fit the part. He yeah. went by looks. And they said to be sorry and lose. But let me tell you a funny story here. I see <laughs> this judging was kind of innocent, but it made me look like a fool, okay? And it wasn't anything harsh on this person, but boy, it made me look like an idiot. So let me tell you a story. It's, it's happened to work. Uh, this lady, she works there, and she was... You know, most pregnant ladies, they, you can tell, they're, they're big, right? They're That's just, tall. All big, right? Right. Okay. <laughs> right. And she missed work for a while. So I assume she took off for maternity leave. Well, I see her. This happened this year. I mean, this is like a few months ago. This is pretty recent. So she was back, and I noticed she was getting big again. And I said, did you have your baby? Oh, God. No. And she says... She says, no. Oh, no. I was like, something happened? She says, no, I'm just fat. She oh, says, I've never been pregnant. She said, I'm an old lady, I'm just fat. Uh, oh. I had a lady wow. at the donut store one day say, Pat me about how far along are you? She said, I at least say, I'm not pregnant. She said, I was going to get two donuts, but I only got one that day. <laughs> but I mean, I, I mean, when you catch yourself in trouble, shut up. Don't ask more questions. I, mean, I was like, oh, okay, I messed up. Did you, did you lose your baby or what? And you're like, no, I'm just fat. <laughs> so I judge by appearance. I judge by appearance. I I've done that before to someone, and wow. it's ever since then. I don't even ask anymore unless I'll, I know for sure. I won't even do it. No. I'll never do it again. Unless they got some babies in there, I'm not saying nothing about it. So I was really embarrassed and felt like a total idiot. But our point is, and the point is, people do look on the out and God right. looks on the heart, which is a very good thing. All right. And that's why he calls us all together in the Christian family, not male, female, rich, poor, Greek. He calls us all together. And that's that's the only plan. I won't say, well, that's the plan of God that we can work this out together. Not because you're male, female, Greek, bond, Jew. We're in this together. We're in a middle of partition. We're in this together. All right, we're grafted in. That's right. That's you like me, I was really? a mule for a little baby. And at the service, I went down to this lady who sat by herself, and I said, Are you a grandmother? 
Oh, they don't want to crawl under a few. <laughs> <laughs> are really big right now, but we had a tendency in farther back a few years ago. I mean, I was guilty of sort of judging people with tattoos. But I've had a big turnaround on that against my judgment. My granddaughter has a couple of tattoos. But I know she's a good kid. She just, you know. So, I mean, I was guilty of judging people with tattoos a few years back. Yeah. Yeah, we have to get away from that. It's like, I've used an example before. If you're at a Walmart parking lot and you see people coming out of the store and you got a guy in a three piece suit carrying a briefcase and you got another guy that's got a hoodie on, maybe sunglasses, kind of scraggly looking, and somebody screams, like, Stop, thief! Who are you going to look at first and thinks the robber? So, I mean, that, that's the thing. We have to be careful how we judge people. So, uh, I had one that I heard a preacher one time earlier say, a good way to define judging too is, ju wrong judging is jumping to conclusions. So you jump to a conclusion that that lady was pregnant. You jump to the conclusion the guy that he was the one robbing the store. So, when you judge without facts, that's wrong. We still have to discern good and evil. Right. But the Bible says there's things from parents of evil. But we have to have a spiritual uh, inclination of what's right and wrong. God is always right. Amen. I, I've got a friend, he's got tattoos. And when he was in the world, he's got skulls on one arm. And now he's got Christ on the cross on the other. And I thank God for him. You know, but if I see him with a one sleeve shirt on, and he's got the skull, I'm going to say, oh my gosh, man. And then if I see him with the other sleeve off and I see Christ, I've got to be careful to spiritually discern good and evil. And looking on the outer appearance is exactly right. There's a guy I played again uh, when I first started there a long time ago. Uh, this guy, big dude, like a biker dude. I mean, just rough with a you know, big old straggly beard. Kind of looked like the Duck Dynasty bunch. He just looked like David if he had a motorcycle. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, David. So anyway, uh, he just looked mean. You know, he just looked that way. But I got to know the guy's a big teddy bear. He's a big teddy bear. So you cannot judge by appearance. Okay, so where are we at here? Uh, 18, I think. Uh, does Jesus ever talk about judging in a positive manner? Okay, we've seen him judge not. We've seen, seen these warnings about judging. Now let's see what this says. Uh, John 7, 24 says, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. So here's telling us to judge, but judge righteously. Okay. Somebody read Luke 7, 41 through 43 for me. Luke 7, chapter 7, verses 41 to 43. New Testament. There was a certain creditor which had two debts. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? Simon answered and said, I suppose he that whom thou forgave most. And he said it to him, thou hast rightly judged. All right, so here uh, you got two verses that talk about judging in, in a good manner. All right, he's telling us to judge. And it, matter of fact, he was actually commended Peter. He was saying yes. And he commended Peter for judging the right way. See, if all judging was wrong, well, Jesus would just made himself a hypocrite here, right? So not all judging is wrong. You just kind of know the proper way to judge. Now, Jesus called a hypocrite a hypocrite. That's right. He said, oh, you hypocrites. And you use the verse. You clean the outside of the plastic mm -hmm. of the inside. But, of course, he had the authority to do it. Yeah, amen. <laughs> I'm not going to question that. <laughs> okay, so, yes, he's in the minute for, for judging the correct way. Now, 19, are we supposed to judge people that claim to be men of God? Yeah, let's see what the Bible says. So now you learn Matthew, the book of Matthew, down to 7, 15 through 20. It's 
smiley bit. There's our girl. Good to see you back. Somebody got that for me? Words false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes or of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Hey, so are we always they suggest people claim being man of God. I think it's pretty clear, isn't it? Yes, and why? How, how, how do we judge them? By their what? What do they bear? Fruit. Yeah. Fruit, which is our actions, our behavior, right? So, yes, we are to judge by our actions. I mean, if, uh, I mean, I'm going to say that. I don't, I don't mean that. Well, those fruits of the Spirit that explain itself love, peace, joy, long suffering. I had an old pastor, because you know, some people get really hung up on judging, and he'd say, well, I may not, I, he may not call me judging, but I'm a fruit inspector. So he said, I'm a fruit inspector. He always say, I'm a fruit inspector. So, it's the same thing. It's a play of words. It's like exam and judge, a sermon, it's all. But anyway, uh, 20, why, why are people quick to say don't judge me? But like I say, a lot of people know John 3, 16, but even if they're not saved, a lot of people know John, uh, Matthew 7, 1 and 2. Why do you think people do that? Don't judge me. The Bible says you're not supposed to judge. Let's go to John 3, John 3, 20, it says, For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved or exposed. So why does people tend to say, don't judge me? Right. They, they don't want to admit they're going wrong, right? You know, my son, he, uh, you know, I got a nice card from him Friday, thanking him for it, and he let me have it Monday. I mean, just land blasted it. And he was defending himself because he knows he's doing wrong, and he wants me to get off his case. So that's that's the automatic defense of using a judgment card. You know, don't judge me. You know, I got to be true to myself. That's actually one thing he said, and that, that's the problem with us now. People want to be true themselves, themselves. I, 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 I. But what's the first thing Jesus said? The following. He said, to "Deny, deny yourself." That's what's step one. Deny yourself. Who are we supposed to be true to? Yeah. It's just like pointing your finger at this. You shouldn't do that. Yeah. But where's that thumb pointing back to? Exactly. So, you know, that's the problem with society. Now, everybody's me, 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 me. And God's down here to stir power if we need it at all. And it shouldn't be that way. That brings to mind about 15, 20 years ago, there was like a social surge where everybody would say, only God can judge me. It was on tattoos, on t shirts, on bumper yeah. stickers. Only God can judge me. Well, if any of us are getting judged out of this, right? You don't, you don't want that. You, you have to come to Christ. People say only God can judge me, as we're saying, so they can kind of excuse their sins, not have to step into the light and admit maybe they're not really where they should be with the Lord. You know, I mean, it's hard for a believer, right, to. Be obedient a hundred percent. Someone that just screams, Oh, only God can judge me, you can't judge me. It, it turned into this weird thing where people would just wave it as a banner to justify or excuse their sins. Yeah, this is a, it's a deflection technique. Yeah, it's it's a it's, it's, you know, don't, don't let them leave. You can't judge me. Just move along, shut you up. Do, you're, mean. Yeah, you're a hater. You're labeled, but yeah. You're a hater and all. Oh, 
tell you, this world is so messed up. I thank God. Y'all talk about a sign. My gosh, look at these parades and people doing what they do. I thank God to just come and sit down in the church, listen, have people that, that I can trust to shake my hand, or at least I think I trust them. <laughs> I mean, I'd rather be here with situations that maybe come up now and then, but Lord, thank God for it. You know, I, 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 I ain't getting in no parade uh, unless it's the right one. I, I ain't seen it like the world. When do people burn police cars and get away with it? When, when is it what, where is the world gone today when the things that happen uh, you know it was mentioned here the other day and, I, and that was a very good point. The people that went down under the sea to see the Titanic. This was, this was an enormous thing all over the news. Millionaires and the money. And then it was mentioned here, I think, by someone. Look at the, the uh, poor migrants that have drowned. People who are poor. Uh, people who have nothing. You don't hear about that so much. And, and here we are today. And, and I love you, Doug. It's a perfect message. If we're not careful, we discern who deserves and who doesn't. Are people saved or are they not saved? I have a great compassion for your son. I know him well. And I love him. But he's wrong. And I've got family the same way. They're wrong. Did I judge them? No. But I spiritually discern. But Jesus, he came to everybody. Everybody. Can you say, can you say the Lord? Everybody. Right. Everybody. Right. I love this plan of salvation. He's kept me out of a lot of trouble. It's really weird that he brings that up about the, the movement they made for, you know, only God can judge me and stuff. When really, ultimately, you're hurting yourself by having that philosophy because you're yeah. condemning yourself to hell by you're saying things like that because you refuse to confront what's actually happening in your life. You're not examining yourself He's or good. anything like that. So really, you're condemning yourself. So yeah, he will be the one to judge you. So you really mean what you're saying? <laughs> right. For real. Like That's what I want to ask people sometimes because I know a few people that are like that and I'm like, you really understand what that means? Because look, it scares me. It scares me a little for you. Yeah, there's it scares a, me sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> there's one thing I, my kids, you know, all kids do this. It's not fair. It's not fair. And I try not to ever use that phrase because if if everybody got what to deserve, we're all we in trouble. Yeah. So right. I'm, I'm thankful that. You know, life's not fair, and that's right. Because, you know, yeah. I can't even say that sometimes. It's not exactly, but it's like, you know, if everyone truly got what they deserve, everyone would be in hell, because that's what we all deserve. Yeah. We're born lost. Right. We're born in carnal nature. Okay, so let's go to 20 here. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Are we, are we to judge ourselves? 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Somebody read that and I'll read uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 31. Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves, know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. Big word. Big old word. Yeah. So that verse is pretty clear, isn't it? Examine oh, yourself. no. Explain reprobate. Tell me how clear it is. Well, reprobate. Uh, <clears throat> To me, reprobate is when the Bible talks about your conscience being seared. Okay. To me, reprobate, and this is why I pray my son don't get to, is when you when you stomp God's grace so much, He's done with you. He's done with you. He's, he's cut you off. And that scares me to death for my son. Because the Bible talks about, I mean, the homosexuals, God gave them up. The reprobate mind, and that's not just for homosexuals; it's for sin too. I mean, you. So they don't have a chance. I, I think they can cross the line. Now, what that line is, I'm not to judge. I don't know. Hey, 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 don't give me that innocence. So, have you make a statement like that? Well, I mean, that's like what's cross the line? Right? 
I love to put you on the spot. <laughs> the the spot. What's cross, what has crossed the line to you? When God says, I give you chance after chance after chance, I'm done. Their conscience is seared. God analyzes exactly who's going to make it and who's not. Well, you have to get through Jesus Christ and ain't going to make it. That's exactly, he's got the criteria, the ABCs right down the line of who's going to be there and who's not and why. As you know, when something's seared, it's not pliable anymore, is it? It's rent. It's stretched, not pliable. So, you know, I'm going to pray for on the sun, but, you know, I, I, I hope pray it doesn't get to that point. I'm, I, might, I might never give it up on the sun. And if he is, I ain't giving up on him. Well, if enough people pray for a person who's reprobate mind, can he be changed? Well, to me, you can cross the line. That's, that's my opinion. God is going to destroy all of his people, and Moses talked him out of it. He interceded on their behalf, just like Jesus interceded on them. What he did to Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. yeah. If you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord hit that cutoff point that you were referring to with Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot and his wife, he said, Get out of here, don't look back. What is behind you, you don't need to be personally, right? Like, fight yourself and your urge to look back and see what I'm doing because it's not none of your business. Your business is to listen to me and get out of here. I thank you, God. God is going to punish the people who also helps the people who believe what they believe. I, I, believe, I believe that a doctor that helps someone <laughs> try to be someone who they're not going to be is going to be accountable for that too. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I don't want to get off trying. This, this Bible is plain and simple. Even a wayfaring person can understand. We have a simple guideline. Well, that's the same way I feel about these doctors who commit abortions. They're accomplished to murder. I'm going to answer for that. Bible What's that? that? Go ahead. She was wanting to go ahead and change class. We talked about that. Oh, I wasn't being rude. I thought he was adding to this. Something, something came to my mind about the only certain age. The father, no matter what the consequences are. Bless you. Mm -hmm. no, Bless you. you got to be first. Amen. Absolutely. Well, guys, I always think we all sin to come toward the door. I mean, we all fall Yes. Forward. I think anybody can be forgiven. True. Anybody. True. No matter what. I believe you can be forgiven. But they got to change their gotta, mind. But you got to confess with your mouth. Bless you. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You can't just confess it. You've got to believe it. Amen. Believe in your heart. Yeah. Good point. Okay, so uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 27, 31 says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and say, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly, many you, many sleep. For if we judge ourselves, we should, we should not be judged. So, here again, there's two verses I give you here about judging ourselves. Yes, we are to judge ourselves. And actually, if we judge ourselves, we'll be less likely to judge others so hard because look at us. You know, kind of like the moon and the, the beam we read about last week. So every time you take the moon, you're judging yourself, right? That's exactly You're supposed to anyway. You never take the moon lighthearted. I mean, it's a serious, sacred thing you do. Not be taken lightly. Uh, I'll tell you what. Let me, let me stop right there. I'll try to finish this up next week. All over here. I'm going to start in the book of Acts. I'm just going to stay in the book of Acts today, uh, which represents the actions of the apostles and the actions of Christ in building the church. But I want to start with this today as the promise of eternal life, the Holy Spirit. And I don't want to start to distract from the baptism services that we have today. For me, uh, in my life of uh, church and people being saved, this is one of the most enjoyable times of a Christian's life 
is to see or be a part of a baptism. This is a, a biblical, very biblical uh, scriptural story of water baptism that goes all the way back. And in Acts chapter 1, you'd read a scripture in verse 5, John truly baptized with water. And Jesus Christ, though, will baptize you. The Bible teaches about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not trying to say there's two, but I'm trying to say the two make one, okay? And the water baptism is to represent the person that is alive. When you go under the water, you don't breathe. If you do, you won't come out the way you went in. And what he's saying is when you are buried under the water and you hold your breath, it washes away the old person to bring up a new. It's a very representative thing of water baptism. And in the spiritual baptism that comes along with that, you have your confession of faith, you follow up with the water baptism, which means you take away the old person and you come up the new person. It has a process. And if we go all the way back to when you were convicted as a sinner, when you believed in Jesus Christ, there's a process. And some people get a taste of it, they go away, or they may come back. But it all comes down to the confession of faith. The perfect example of what Jesus was saying, he was a perfect individual. Think of that. Jesus is the Son of God and a perfect individual. So I'm not saying that until you're baptized, you're not saved. But in the criteria of it, Jesus, he even came to John, right? And he was baptized of John by the river of Jordan. You'd think, well, Jesus certainly didn't need to be baptized, but he set the example of water baptism. And all the people, I want you to know that John were baptizing for the remission or the forgiveness of sin. Let's remember Jesus had not yet been crucified and resurrected from the dead. But he set an example of the living people that we live today, how important it is for water baptism. And Jesus made it clear that there would be, when you read the Bible in the book of Acts, in the day of Pentecost, along in chapter 2, he speaks about the day that the Holy Spirit came, not by water baptism, but by believers, right? And he's clear that the Holy Spirit that came down and the Holy Spirit that came into life, there was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's not something that's ever gone away. It's something that fulfills your desire of being saved. It's a witness to the world about people who go under the water to give their life. And you know, I know that people have, some people have a great fear of the water. Some people have a fear. My wife is one. She, she, we tried to take her to the beach a couple of times. And when you put your feet in the water, she starts screaming. <laughs> and I'm not exaggerating. She's scared of the water. I couldn't make a joke about me having to hold her under the shower, but that wouldn't fit very well. <laughs> Butch like that. When we come to the place of water baptism, it's a big decision. It's an important thing that people follow up with what they believe. Now, I, I didn't know Timothy until today, but that's what the church is for, is to represent what you believe in Jesus Christ. And in this time span, God made a way for you through the church and the future for this family here to be baptized by water baptism and some people put it off. And in the time of apostles and disciples, they followed up on water baptism. And I'll leave this example as we would go through some of the scriptures there's a, 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 a follower, a disciple, not an apostle. His name was Stephen. And we get along in chapter 5, chapter 6. And Stephen, you, you know, we think about situations in the church. You know, even with all the greatness of the apostles, there was one, Judas, 
who had betrayed the Lord and he was not in the apostleship or the discipleship and they chose another to take his place, remember? And his name was Matthias. And, but though there was another there by the name of Justice and the church had to decide who, who we're going to pick you. And you know, back then they drew lots. Think of that. We pray, we see who's going to take an office or who's going to do this thing. And back then, once when Jesus was on the ship, or Judas, or not, not Jesus or Judas, but remember Jonah was on the ship, and they said, well, we've got to draw straws. They're all equal, but there's one short straw. And that's the same as casting lots. And then, of course, you know, Jonah was cast out of the ship. And he went on about doing what he was supposed to do in the first place and would have helped him to not have to hold his breath three days in the well, but I'm just joking. In casting lots then, they're deciding on the two, and by then the history teaches me that they had stones with names written on them. was another way to cast lots. And there was Matthias, and I'm almost sure it was Justice. I may have missed that. But then they would draw the name of the rock and the one who had the majority was the one that would be a disciple. Today we have a vote. We vote for people. We vote for people to hold office. We have nominations. It's the fair, but there's a criteria of being in the body of Christ and in the church because there's some pastors, some deacons, some officers, teachers, but all these are aligned in the Holy Spirit of God. And I think sometimes, and I'm not saying this about the church, I think sometimes people are put in an office of something because of who they know, not what they know. I'm not saying that here. I'm very thankful for the officers that the church has chosen. But let me say this. I'm even that as much thankful for the people who attend the church and take a part in doing what's right to continue to build the church in righteousness. Amen. We're all important. And as Stephen was confronted about his duty in the apostle or in the discipleship, Stephen, even though he was he stood just exactly as double taught amongst the people of the world. And if you read the scriptures, when Stephen was to, was to be stoned, they were in a synagogue. Think about this. Different peoples of different religious and different beliefs were in a synagogue. And they were there to persecute Stephen about the church. There were people there from Africa, Italy, that were supposed to be people that were representing God and religious individuals. And there were people from all about the nation in the synagogue. And I'll tell you what, last night in the same, there were people here from every other name that was over the door, but we all came in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank God for that service, that there were people of other uh, names over the door, and I'm not getting into all of that, but thank God we were here to worship Him and worship Him in spirit and truth. That's where we are in the world today. Many are called and few are chosen. And I want to give you just an idea of the world today. People will believe almost anything before they'll believe the truth. They'll believe almost anything other than Jesus did die for our sins. And this is what Stephen called all these other people. He said, you're stiff-necked. You're set in your ways. You're just who you are. That means you're very stubborn in what you believe. Sometimes I found out the Spirit of God had to change my mind. He had to work from here to get it right, to take us from a world of sin, to put us in a world of people who are righteous or striving to be righteous. The church. This great persecution that came against the church, the, the, the whole church, they stoned Stephen to death. And he died. Stoned, looking up, and Stephen saying, put this charge not to them, 
Don't blame them. They're lost. My, my. Where is the world going to today? So many different beliefs. So much confusion. Take away the Bible, you take away the truth. When you take away the witness of a true Christian and you put that person to death, the effects of that person's life who died for Jesus Christ has put a stop to that witness and testimony and God help us. Unless you're willing to die for Jesus Christ, then that testimony goes on. Have you ever just looked at the church really close at the elderly, the older people, the true believers? We had two children here last night, young teenagers, I would suppose, of all the church. And this is not criticism because I know my granddaughter was out doing something else. I know my daughter was out doing something else. I don't know where most of the people are, but I know that if they don't worship the Lord deep sincerely in their heart, they're out there doing something else. It's more important. Yes, and I think Dougal, myself, and some of you, we take some sort of the blame. But I tell you, I know that my wife and myself have raised our children up the way they should go. I'll not be accountable for teaching them wrong or telling them wrong. I, I'll tell you, I may be staying accountable for some wrong decisions in life, but the decision that I raised and my wife took in the church taught them that that was my responsibility, and I thank God that they know what they know and they'll be accountable for what they do with it. I don't regret one bit. Amen. Baptism. Is this particular way that God has set the table and we come and die. God has set the table for us to enjoy a day. And I use this example. There's plenty of water around here. Plenty of water. It takes me on over. Once I say a little further in the book of Acts, I think it's 7, 8, 9, where Philip, Philip, who is a disciple, is in a great revival in Jerusalem. And there's an individual, an Ethiopian, if you read the scripture, a man that is under Candace the queen who has been to Jerusalem and he becomes very interested in what is being taught. And he's off to himself somewhere reading in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 54, I think it is, maybe 55 now in my mind, stir about Jesus about a, 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 a lamb that was led as a slaughter, yet not he opened up his mouth. And God, through this service, we talk about a miracle, or we can't get in a car and drive 20 minutes. Here, Philip, here is miles and miles away. This man over here is a, a, in a place miles away, and God takes Philip up, and we talk about a whirlwind or a journey, and Philip ends up right here, with this Ethiopian who is wanting to be saved. Sometimes we're in places we may think we shouldn't be or how did we get there, but if you're serving a true and living God, you've got a reason for being where you are. You've got a purpose for being in the place, whether it may not be your comfort zone or not, God has a purpose for you to be where you are when you're there. But don't volunteer to go where you shouldn't go. That place over there, I see that sign. I thank God I'm not going to the outer limits <laughs> until it's time to go to the outer limits. <laughs> Y'all seen the sign too, did you? <laughs> I'm going to the church. I'm going to the place where we can be together. And we can work this out together. My, 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 help us, Lord. In this confession of faith, and here's a man, an Ethiopian. Oh, an Ethiopian, does that sound like he's a different color? Sound like he's from another nation, maybe? Maybe from another place who had journeyed that God brought him to a journey 
all the way to Jerusalem to be mixed up with all these people. He's off to himself. He's reading the book of Isaiah. And he asks, well, what must I do to be saved? And he gets the message, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he preaches a message of baptism. Now he's in the desert, if you read it. He's in a chariot, he's by himself, and he's in the desert. And he said, well, what keeps me from being baptized? Well, there's water. Wow. Who a God provides, doesn't he? Here this individual is out here. God sends Philip all the way from a great revival to one, one more individual on a chariot reading the Bible to be saved, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and a water hole there in the desert. Wow. Sometimes I think of the people that go out of the way or won't go out of the way. Everything in your Christian life is not Convenient, but it's very important. Amen. Every place we may go, you know, this is a, a nice journey for us to, to have a place to go and to worship. We, we sometimes, I hopefully don't forget how privileged we are that God set a plan to have us in a padded pew, an air conditioner, or have a place where we can come and get along and if nothing else, at least be Friends. Oh, I preach hard on that. I do. I, I, I preach hard on that. Lord, if you can't shake somebody's hand, who's missing? Something ain't right. So sometimes, biblically, we need to examine ourselves. When we take a look at ourselves, we can look at others differently. I know up the street above my house, there's drug dealing, there's fighting. Yesterday, this woman's out there getting punched and she got a pretty good piece of the guy that punched her. But anyway, you know, I don't go knocking on their door, but I know this, I can pray for them. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm sorry for people like that. We've all been lost in a world of sin. We can't turn our back on things like that, on the people. As a matter of fact, a few months ago, the I was outside in the road doing something there with the two dogs I have. And, I, and, and here she comes with one shoe on. Poor thing. But you know, she talked to me like a human being. We had a conversation. It wasn't my place to say, oh, go away. You deal with drugs or I know where you live. No. No. We have to be friends. But we have to be careful. This Ethiopian, in all of his journey, he's confessed his sin. He's been baptized and has a hope of eternal life. I don't know everything that I like to imagine out in that other world when all this is over and the kingdom of God is established on this new heaven and new earth. But I, I, I kind of think one day, I don't know what I'll remember in the scriptures or in the past, but can I say, hey, was you that Ethiopian that uh, met Philip way down there back 25 years after Jesus resurrected from the dead? I don't know. But if I do, and I do think I know, I'm sure going to ask him. Uh, did that Ethiopian go back and raise a big church up for Christ? I couldn't tell you that history, but it was a fair I question. Yes. But what I'm saying here in that synagogue when Stephen was to be stoned, there were people from Italy. There were people from Greece. And all they were were in a synagogue and God sent a preacher down there to preach to them. And I'll tell you what, they got so mad, they rose up and took his life. Did the same for Jesus, right? I'll tell you, I love you, church. And this is why today we're going to have a baptism. John truly baptized with water, but there's something that is greater and more powerful that will grow in your life and get stronger, and that's the Holy Spirit. I think this comes on people's minds so many times. 
I've been asked, should I be baptized again? If you ask, probably. But it's still your choice. We had a lady at Mammoth, Kelly's Creek. I'll never forget her. If there was a baptism, she was going to be baptized. I mean, the lady, if there were, and she said, I've been baptized so many times that tadpoles know me by name. <laughs> God love. Come on. The baptism is not just for those who have want to be baptized, but it's for anyone that wants to be baptized or baptized again. We have one chance in this life we live to make it right and to make it all the way. So when we go to this service, you're all well aware of it, where the camp is. If you have any questions, you need a ride. Uh, Sylvia and Tim, they're going to ride with us, I think, right? And that's fine. What? <laughs> now what you think? We'll be fine. He's, he's trying to figure out who's the worst driver, me or Sylvia. I'm teasing. Uh, I'm joking. I don't get nervous, but I get, I get a little sometimes anxious. <laughs> <laughs> You're fine, Butch. Butch is praying for you because you're riding with me. <laughs> My wife prays all the time. I've only told them five. <laughs> so now Tim says, is there anybody else going? <laughs> I hope any of you or all of you can make it. I know some do, some don't. And it's an opportunity also to see the camp. And I give a lot of credit to the works and the peoples that oversee this camp. And we can picnic there. We can make appointments to go there at times. And it's a Christian camp. And we have worship there. And we have young people that go to the camp. Youth camp. It's important. They baptize some out there during this camp and they have another camp come. It's a wonderful place to be because we take the Spirit of God with us. Any comments before we dismiss? I wanted to get a little bit more into the baptism and we'll mention that a little further as we go out. Anyone have anything you want to say? Uh, last time we were going to baptize 